welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you for joining me. If this is your first time here and you like crime and you like consistency, then I am definitely the channel for you. So make sure that you give me a subscribe, give me a like, have a chat with me, join one of my lives, do any of those things. But essentially, no, then I'm very pleased to have you. Also, big thank you to everybody who's supporting me on Patreon. I hope you're enjoying the little bits of content that are being put on there. Getting excited, a few professionals coming on having a natter about their work, stuff that I just sit there open-mouthed at and think, wow, I need to pick your brains for eternity. The case I'm gonna to cover today is one that I wanted to cover for a whole host of reasons, but primarily because I really struggle with the term honor killing. Don't get it. I understand the history of it. I recognize the cultural and societal, social elements of it, but the fact it's called an honor killing blows my mind a little bit. And I'm gonna be really honest, I'm coming from a white female Western perspective. And because of that, I do appreciate that I don't know what it's like being brought up in a specifically highly orthodox religious environment with expectations, so I appreciate my bias, but nonetheless, my bias is not going to be something that denies the reality of the fact that there is no such thing as an honor killing. Killing is wrong, per se. And if that sounds judgmental, good. And if you struggle with that, probably not worth watching because I'm gonna come down hard on this, no matter what people's perspectives of this background and the history and the reasons behind the term honor killing. I'm gonna cover the case of Shafia Ahmed, and to me, full stop, I think there are no crimes as shocking as when a parent murders a child. It goes against the very grain of what, in my belief system, makes us human, which is the desire to procreate, the desire to find meaning through our offspring, the desire to protect that offspring at all costs, to the point where if somebody came to kill my child, they better run because it would not end well for them. And I mean, my imagination goes to the fact that I would rip their heads off with my bare hands. And I know that for all you mama and dada bears out there, you are gonna feel exactly the same. Good, because that's what a really protective parent thinks that they would do, and rightfully so. So this case goes against nature, per se. It goes against the fundamental role of parents and the mother and father instincts that pretty much the majority of us are hard wired to have to the point where if you see another person's child in danger or in need you would intervene and help them that's how hard wired we tend to be to protect children now for the parents of 17 year old shafela ahmed it seems that this isn't the case tradition and honor would literally come before the life of their daughter her father iftika ahmed moved to the uk when he was 10 years of age so he was fully familiar with western culture he didn't have an orthodox lifestyle in the UK to the point where he actually married a Danish woman in 1982, Vivi Lone Anderson. They had a son together and they lived in the very cosmopolitan Copenhagen in Denmark for some time. And they lived a very Western life. In fact, it's said by people who knew him at that time that he literally embraced the Western way of life fully. And what's not to like in a lot of ways? We have a lot of fun in Western life. I completely appreciate that some people want to remain completely ultra-Orthodox to their cultural norms. I get it. But for those individuals who choose to break free of them, there are some fun aspects to Western life. You know, Western life gets a lot of negativity thrown at it very often, but there is a certain degree of liberty and freedom that compels you to be able to be creative with your life and experience the world around you fully and soak up culture and just have fun. And he loved it. He enjoyed dancing, he enjoyed drinking alcohol, he enjoyed going to discos when he lived in Denmark, and we appreciate that for people from strict religious backgrounds, you're not often meant to do those kind of things, but it's completely acceptable if you choose to. However, in spite of the fact that he's married, in spite of the fact that it's having the time of his life partying, he goes back to Pakistan in 1985. His mum's unwell. And that's obviously important because she may die and he wants to make peace with that. He wants to be supportive and he wants to be around his family at that difficult time. Now, 
his family are not impressed by his marriage, really frowned upon by all of his relatives in Pakistan. And even though he, to all intents and purposes, has been having a really great life with his wife, he starts to really bend under that pressure. And Iftikhar finds it a struggle to negotiate his family's beliefs around the way he's living with his personal experience in his relationship. So he returns back to his home village of Utam in the Gujarat district of rural Pakistan. Ironically, he goes back there. Why? Yes, to see his mother, to hang out with his family. But what could be another reason to leave his wife in Copenhagen with their child to go back to Pakistan. Oh, you'd be surprised to know, it was to organize an arranged marriage. Obviously, wife in Denmark, not aware of this. In fact, as far as she's concerned, she's moving to Bradford with him because he's asked her to go there. Now, for those of you who don't know Bradford in the UK, it's a very diverse area. I live in a really diverse area. We have a really high Jewish population where I live, Hasidic, so very orthodox, very high orthodox Muslim population here. Very, very harmonious. I'm gonna be honest with you. I live in an area where there are some pretty strict orthodoxes around religion and we inhabit it very, very well. Bradford is also a place where there is lots and lots of Muslim individuals who live there. And I would say that one of the things that's been recognized about the Bradford area is that certain areas feel like they're not very British. And that isn't to say it's a bad thing. It just means that people who follow a certain belief system often inhabit areas where others follow that too. And it can feel almost as if you're not in a Western area. But like I said, in Bradford, like where I live, it's a harmonious place to inhabit. But it is unsurprising that if you're an Orthodox Muslim, you're going to want to go and live around people who reflect those belief systems. And that will have positive elements and it'll also have really negative elements too. Because whenever you get a condensing of a culture that is trying to coexist with a world outside, particularly a Western world, understandably, Think about bringing up children, it can create some conflict. Because when I worked with young women who were being into forced marriages, one of the things that women would say to me, these are younger girls at college age, they used to feel like they were standing behind glass. They could see the world all around them. They could look at a life that essentially was just feet away from them, but they couldn't access it. It was really challenging for them. So they brought up at home with a cultural set of expectations that are very specific and yet they're attending western environments and they can see that there's this whole raft of opportunities that they don't feel that they can access or if they choose to access there are consequences to those actions so it's very very challenging so his wife who obviously is moving to bradford thinking that she's going to be with her husband as you would imagine Oh, when it's your husband. And it's a big move. Copenhagen's an amazing place. So she's giving up her lifestyle there as well. Arrives at the home to see her husband. And guess what? His cousin's there, living in the house, heavily pregnant. And I know what you're thinking. Look, at the end of the day, Emma, it's his cousin. She probably needed somewhere to stay. She is heavily pregnant, this is correct, with his baby. It would not have ended well for him if I had turned up to find my husband with his cousin who was carrying his child. The story may have been a different murder one in that case. Iftikhar basically admits later on that he is the father of the cousin's child. And he also says the reason that he's brought her back to the UK is because they had been promised to each other as children. This is something that happens regularly, that cousins will be identified as a future partner for one another, literally at birth. Vivi, his wife, goes, sod off, that's it. You can stay here with your cousin in this weird setup. I'm running back to Denmark and I'm taking your kid with me. Very good sense, Vivi. Bradford, with another wife and husband, probably wasn't going to work out for you. And he says, well, I'm going to let you take my son 
because when it comes down to it, my son will not need my influence because he's male. Just work that one out. You can take my son with you back to Denmark because it seems that men are hardwired with knowing how to act clearly. Therefore, he will not require any role model to help inform him of how to be a man. I mean, I think he had a lucky escape with respect with that father anyway. But the point is, think about the bias that's being explored there and expressed there. He's saying that a man, a boy, who's brought up in society doesn't need guidance. But a girl, well, that's a different thing. In fact, he claimed that if the child had been female, he would not have been able to allow her to grow up without his guidance on the Islamic ways. So he felt it was essential if it was a female child that they are brought up in an Islamic environment with his guidance. Whilst he's married still, by the way, to Vivi, he goes to Pakistan again and he marries his first cousin. As we know, it's not legal. However, Sharia law means that sometimes a man who is married can take another wife. And even in the UK, there are places where Muslim males will have several wives. Often those wives will be individuals who need taking care of. It might be that they've been widowed or divorced. They might be a single parent. They might be someone who's converted to the faith and has children and requires a male figure in their life. And they literally share them. And don't get me wrong, that's something that from a Western-centric model, I don't really get. It's certainly not something that the Muslim population feel is a good thing on the whole. It's only practiced by a few individuals. But nonetheless, that's probably why he's able to get away with it. He also said that one of the reasons why he went to Pakistan to get married to his cousin, who's called Fazana, is because she said that if he didn't, she'd kill herself. A little bit dramatic. <laughs> A little bit on the dramatic side there for Zana. You know, just have the baby, stay with your partner, move on. But no, she threatens him that way. And I would imagine on two levels, she's probably emotionally very distressed that she's pregnant because that's a shameful thing in Muslim belief systems to be a woman who's not betrothed and pregnant. But also there is a level of manipulation there, isn't there? It's a way of making him feel that he has to carry out a certain behavior or there will be a terrible consequence. Now, unlike Iftikhar, Fazana didn't have any experience of Western culture. So her life had been in Pakistan and it had been in a rural area of Pakistan. So we are talking about a massive culture shock. Even though Bradford has got lots and lots of elements of that kind of lifestyle, it is still a modern city. So you are going to feel completely out of sorts when you're in an environment like that. So she settles in Bradford with her husband and he becomes a taxi driver. At this point, Fazana is pregnant with Shavila. So she's going through the motions of being a new mum for the first time in a world that is very foreign to her. They also lived as ultra conservative Pakistanis. So they were individuals who were very devoted at this point to their faith. So they lived as Sunni Muslims and native Punjabi speakers. Big detraction when you consider where he had lived previously in Denmark. So a big change for all parties. So Shafila is born on the 14th of July, 1986. And it's at this point that the family decide to move and they go to a really small, but a really well-established Asian community in Warrington just shortly after the birth of Shafila. Now, this means that they clearly want to continue a relationship with their religion and community that feels bound by individuals who reflect that around them. It's important to them that they reflect and experience a world that is familiar, even though they're living in the UK. They want to have those elements of Pakistan. They go on to have four more children. They have three daughters, that's Alicia, Mevish, also an unnamed minor that I can't discuss because they were too young to be named during the hearings. But nonetheless, that was the third child who was female. And they also had a son, Junyad. The family was raised in the Great Sankey area of Warrington in Cheshire. And that particular area is, yes, British, but you wouldn't necessarily feel it was that British if you experienced it because the social and cultural attitudes were very much those of rural Pakistan. 
And this meant that there was a particular way of life that was imposed upon their children. And it's important to use that word imposed because in my experience, that's certainly how a lot of young people who are growing up in these environments feel. They want to experience the Western world, but they're held back because the parents want them to be traditional. Now, Shafila was considered a really shy and quiet girl, but really lovely. She was considered kind, compassionate, and she had a close circle of really good friends. And they used to say that she was really happy, really giggly. She was also very, very bright. And I want to put that out there so that you kind of start to visualize and understand the way that Shafila wanted her life to play out. She did really well in her GCSEs and she had this huge dream. Her dream was to go to university and she wanted to pursue a career in law. She wanted to be a barrister. So she had big dreams. And I feel that one element of going to university was absolutely indeed about her becoming a barrister and her excelling in her field. Of course, she was a very bright girl. But I think that university stands for so much more, doesn't it? When you think about university, you think about mixing with lots of new people, going out, having fun, growing into a human adult that experiences a world that is so much more diverse than the one that you've inhabited previously. It means that your parents aren't always aware of what you're doing, particularly if you get to live in halls. It means that you can thrive as a unique individual. And I also want to acknowledge that I have Muslim friends who've often said to me, one of the problems that I have in understanding their experience is that I see people as unique individuals. Whereas many of my friends who are Muslim say that they come from more of a community perspective. So it's how will my actions impact on my community? How can I act in a way that means that I am part of that community in a positive way? Whereas for me, I'm like, hell no, I'm going to think about what my needs are and how I look after those so that I feel happy in my life. But to some degree, Shafila is starting to make a break out from this very traditional world into hopefully a place of freedom and liberty and growth and education and future. She wanted to live a life which was normal to somebody like myself in this country and in the town that she lived. That's what she wanted, to just have a more Western experience. Because she really struggled with the way that her father wanted her to live. She couldn't tolerate it to some degree. And he could not tolerate the life that Shavila wanted to live. He wanted her to live with the family as if they were in Pakistan, even though they were in Warrington in the UK. And in her parents' community, Shafila starts standing out as a bit of a problem and people start bringing in the idea that she's bringing shame upon the family. And I want you to think about how difficult it would be for her not to bring shame upon her family when you hear about their expectations regarding the behavior that she was meant to have. Because one, she attended a local school. So essentially she was surrounded by boys and girls. And this is a big problem for her family. One, her father really did not like her socializing with girls from the white community. That is his words, not my words. So he considered the white community to be a shameful community and one that he did not want his daughter involved with. Also, he completely objected to her wearing Western clothes. He also didn't want her to have any contact with boys. Don't send her to a school with boys. Let's think about that if you've got an issue. Because how is she going to do that? You have to connect with boys at school. You have to be in classes with them. You have to do all the things that school commands of you. It's not your problem if you sat next to a boy doing a science experiment, but that apparently was bringing shame on the family, which is ironic, isn't it? Because what Shafila was, was pleasant and engaging and agreeable. They are things that are within her nature. They are not that she's cultivating some kind of inappropriate relationship with people. It's just part of her personality but she's getting judged for that. And other kids with parents who are attending that school are feeding back the fact that Shafila is engaging with white kids and also with boys. Her parents also made her wear trousers at school. They didn't want her to be showing off her legs. 
Again, humility in lots of religions is required. I don't think that that's excessive. If you have that belief system, I think it's quite difficult as a girl. You want to express yourself however you wish to, but I understand the fundamentals of her parents wanting her to be modest in that respect. However, I don't agree at all for one minute that it is acceptable to not allow your child to go swimming because of the religious restrictions that you feel need to be imposed. I think that that is where education and parenting has a problem. Personally, I feel that a school, when you've got curriculum-based lessons such as swimming, need to exert the control over that situation playing out. A girl should be allowed to go swimming, even if they buy a burkini and she is wearing very modest clothing in that respect. The point is, it's exercise and it's liberty and it's opportunity for health. And no parent should feel that a religious belief system should stop their child doing things that firstly are good for them and secondly are completely normal. But you can see that there is this conflict culturally, isn't there? And for her, she's looking around and she's trapped between two worlds. You know, her culture, the way of life that she's brought up within her family and the culture around her, the Western life that she wants to embrace. Now her dad, wants her desperately to appreciate the cultural heritage from which she's come from. We all understand that. And actually, there's a lot of research regarding individuals who live in Western countries who don't have access to those kind of environments and don't have access to that kind of history. And they don't necessarily feel as connected because it's really important to know where you came from, your incredible history, your authentic process of arriving in a Western world, but still carrying with you and cultivating such important cultural experiences. The way that we eat, the way that we live is all influenced hugely by diversity. And it's something that rightly so we embrace, but it should be a choice, right? That's all. You can't force somebody to want something. It goes against the very nature psychologically of what makes us the individual. We want certain things for ourselves. It doesn't matter how many times you tell me I have to do something, unless I wish to do it, I'll either not, I'll refuse, or I'll do it resentfully so it won't be authentic. You cannot batter somebody into a position where they wish to do something. You can make them submit. You can prevent them from having their freedom if they fail to, but that's all on your terms and nothing to do with the reality. And actually it goes against the very thing you're trying to achieve because you're not replicating your own belief systems within them. You're forcing them and the person will just agree because there seems to be no other option. As far as Shafila's family were concerned, she was expected to live in a completely sealed cultural environment, completely separate from that other country in which she lived. It's completely unrealistic. In fact, it's more than that. It's destructive and it's cruel. Her parents were unbelievably controlling. Her teenage years were not nice. They consisted of constant household chores. These went on late into the night and then those chores were followed by schoolwork. Note, the chores came before the schoolwork. As a free emancipated female in the UK, schoolwork should definitely come before housework but it kind of shows you what she's being trained for because that's what wives are expected to do in certain circumstances so the fact that she has to do all the chores before she's allowed to do her education she's being given a very clear message isn't she and her school used to complain that she was often late because when she got up in the morning she had to do housework before she went to school again showing her school is secondary and when you think about the problems that you can encounter as a parent when your child is repeatedly turning up late, you are introducing possible issues to it, aren't you? Because the school will start recording that. Often they'll speak to the local education authority and often the result of that, well, you'll get a visitor, particularly back in the day, from the wag man or wag woman. And I should know because I worked as one for a very short period of time. Now, she didn't have a life for outside college at all and she desperately wanted one. She really did. Because she enjoyed her social experience at college. She enjoyed hanging out with her friends and she wanted to have more of it. Who didn't want to have more of it? My God, I think college more than university, the two years where you have most freedom because you kind of go from being in that structured school experience where it's very much all day and then going home and doing homework and doing subjects that you're crap at. Is that just me? <laughs> I was 
so bad at so many subjects. So suddenly studying things that you kind of like and you have more time and you want to enjoy yourself. You don't really think about the future that much. You're thinking about what you're going to do at the weekend. And she's being denied this opportunity. Her father is just the complete head of the household. And to put this in context, he was a bully as well as being a head of a household. And we can see that, can't we? He's massively controlling behavior. And in May 2002, he actually threw his wife and all five children out of the house to the point where they had to be temporarily accommodated at a travel lodge. And it's at this point that social services get involved. What does that say about him though? What kind of a man stroke father in the loosest of terms that I will use for this individual throws his five children onto the street and stays in the home? What is that telling you about him? Aside from the obvious power play, it's the arrogance. It's a complete disrespect of responsibility, the denial of responsibility. As far as he's concerned, the only needs that matter are his. And that gives us direct insight into his psychology. So it seems like Shafila's father is incredibly dominating over that entire family. One of the bugbears that her parents had with her involves what she wants to wear. She wants to wear Western clothes like her friends. She wants to dress up, in her opinion, normally. Also, she wants to choose boyfriends for herself. She wants to hang out with people that she's friends with at college. And these are all big problems. In 2002, the summer of that year, one of the problems for her community and for her parents is she starts to establish relationships with young men. They're not sexual. They're not physical. These are just friendships with young men, as you would expect. This is normal. And it should be normal throughout every culture, in my opinion. I'm biased. I'm a white Western woman. I get it. You're entitled to your opinion. If you disagree with me, I'm just saying from my perspective. And certainly from Shafila's perspective, she mirrors what my thoughts are. Anyway, her parents massively disapprove with that. As far as her parents are concerned, if she had any kind of contact with Western boys, it meant that she was damaged goods. I mean, how can a child that you've born, that you've brought up, that's excelled at school, who's got these big ideas and dreams for the future, apparently they're damaged goods because, you know, they hang out and chat to boys, even though there's nothing else within that relationship. It's completely innocent. But this is the level of expectation that is placed upon her. So it means that Shafila goes and has a sense of a secret life to some degree. So she keeps her Western clothes at college, her false nails, her makeup's kept in a locker at school. And what she will do, and we've all been in situations like this, haven't we? Where we know our parents won't approve, so we kind of make sure that we do things elsewhere. So she would go into college dressed in her traditional gear, and then she'd get changed into her Western clothes, and then change back before going home. However, big problem is that there are loose lips around. So all the members of the Pakistani community would report her for in inverted commas, shameful, stroke, completely normal behaviour. But this was really bad for her parents. As far as they were concerned, she was bringing complete shame on her family. And the fact that members of the Pakistani community were saying not only was she wearing clothes that she shouldn't and wearing makeup that she shouldn't, she was also hanging around with white kids whilst wearing those Western clothes. Iftikhar, just to say, is also known for having a really quick temper. So... He's, in the past, got into trouble for breaking a colleague's window and for punching a colleague. He was actually later prosecuted and fined for criminal damage. So he has some history of violence. On another occasion, grabs a customer by the necktie. Why? Because apparently he didn't have change for a £10 note to pay his fare. I mean, what is going on? Is it just me? little bit of an overreaction. Can I pay my fare? Yes. You don't have change? I'm going to beat you up. But we're being shown poor impulse control, high temper, obviously a low threshold where he's considering what is appropriate action from this situation, which I've just noted, to violence. Now, as I've said about Shavila's dad, All he was trying to do throughout her childhood, throughout her teens, is to impose his cultural values and attitudes. This is done by intimidation, by bullying, and by the use of physical violence. She's very, very frequently physically abused by her parents, so not just by her dad, 
her mother did it as well. In fact, what they would do is tag team to some degree. So one would hold her down and the other would beat her. Now, teachers see this. They said that she would turn up at school crying and she would be very open. She would say that her mum would slap her, would throw a slipper at her, and the school gave her the telephone number for Childline. I would have liked to have seen a great deal more action. If a school is aware that a child is being physically aggressed and domestically abused, I don't think the Childline number is the right action. It's social services, and hopefully it's either the family being educated on how to act appropriately or children being removed. She also used to talk to the teachers about the fact that her mother would say, I can't wait for you to go to Pakistan. I'm going to teach you a lesson. And also she used to say to Shafila that she was adopted. So this is really high level nastiness, isn't it? Going out of her way to constantly threaten her daughter, to tell her that if she's not careful, she's going to end up in Pakistan. I and mean, you know what that's going to mean. She's going to get married off. And also to be told, you're not even mine. Because that's just not normal behaviour for a mother. Like, who would do that? The psychological torture of a child in that way. Although I bet Shafila was thinking, God, I hope you are. I hope you are my adopted parents and I can just leave you. Because I would want to feel like that. Because it's awful, the kind of abuse that she's going through. And one of Shafila's friends said there was an occasion where she dyed her hair and she also put on false nails. And her mother physically forced her to wash her hair and she also ripped her nails off and called her a slut. I don't know whether her mother needs to look up the definition of the word slut, not that any female should be called that name. What you choose to do with your body and your behaviour in that respect, as long as it's consenting, is fully acceptable. So nobody is a slut. But the fact that her mother's bar of that is, oh, you've got hair dye in and you're wearing nails, therefore you are a slut. And again, that emotional abuse, that controlling behaviour, that shaming her simply because she wanted to look a little bit different. Another time, her mother and father threatened her with a knife. She should have been removed. She should have been absolutely taken to a place of safety. All the kids should have. They even imprisoned her in a room for several days without any food. So now we're seeing an escalation, aren't we? As the family are losing control, over her decisions, thought processes, future ideas, over the relationship she's having, they are starting to become more desperate. And the way that they're utilising control in this way is to make sure that she is aware that her actions have severe consequences, even if that means starving her. They would also lock her out. So if she did something that they weren't happy with, they would lock her outside, and her siblings would actually pass her food secretly through the window. I mean, that in itself is beyond abusive, isn't it? Because they're involving the children as well now. So her younger siblings are seeing this, they are witnessing this increase in violence. It seems that the majority of her parents' violence towards her was triggered by the friends that she kept. They hated her being around white girls. They hated her being around the music that's very fashionable, they hated her being in non-traditional clothes. These are such small slights on the family's ideas of what is correct, and yet they were huge for them. And the other thing that seemed to provoke even more intense violence and aggression was when Shafila had male friends, and they could not bear it. To the point where they became so controlling that they even began to take her to school and from school, which is really hard when you're a child trying to live a life which feels a little bit more free because you don't get those opportunities to just have that socialization before and after school which is what you want but it was their way of giving her a very clear message we own you you will come and go as we choose not as you please and the parents were quite good at hiding the abuse so they managed to hide it to some degree at least from social services and the police even though Shafila reported the abuse constantly. She would tell teachers that they weren't just abusing her, they weren't just threatening her, they were also saying they were going to take her to Pakistan and force her into an arranged marriage. And she was telling this to authorities on multiple occasions. Nothing happened. 
nothing was done. I have a real big problem with this. I don't think it's as bad currently as it was at the time that Shafila died, but we had a problem for a long time. Certainly when you look at the Rotherham sex cases of exploitation and lots of places in the UK, certainly I've encountered were very poor when it was Pakistani minority groups who were acting reprehensibly and completely inappropriately. For some reason, authorities didn't like getting involved for fear that they would be seen as culturally insensitive. Piss off. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that because, oh, let's be a bit sensitive around somebody's culture, because you know, at the end of the day, it might be seen as inappropriate if we engage, leading to people getting murdered or sexually exploited, no excuse. Shame on the authorities. Shame on the authorities. Shame on anyone who supported that notion. Shame on the environments and the attitudes of the individuals, even within those communities who supported them. It's why people die. It's why people are horribly brutalised and raped. But for whatever reason, certainly in the 80s and 90s, there was this resistance for authorities to get involved when there were different cultural norms to the white-centric model. Ridiculous. The reason we have this safeguarding child protection, the needs and wishes of the Child Being Paramount Children's Act in the UK is because we have evolved to put children as a priority. But for whatever reason, in spite of the fact that she's constantly telling authorities that she's in this awful situation, they do nada. And the family, whenever difficult questions are asked, just claim that they're victims of racial prejudice. So that's what they do. You're just being racist. You're just being culturally unaware. No, your behavior's reprehensible. It's got a sod all to do with your religion and everything to do with your terrible, aggressive, shameful parenting. One of her teachers was so concerned at school that she would often speak to Shafila. And she actually said at one point, do I need to be worried about you? And Shafila said, yeah. And after Shafila had been absent from school on one period of time, the teacher who really engaged well with her and was constantly worried about her, she noted that she had faded bruising on her neck and she also had a cut to her lip. And Shafila was able to explain to the teacher that her father had beaten her whilst the mother had held her down. So this dual experience of being abused by the two very people that are meant to be role models, that are meant to care for you more than anybody else, that must have been absolutely terrifying. Listen, if you're in a household with an abuser, it is terrible per se. But if you are looking at an abuser, usually to some degree you may have a protector. You may have another parent who's trying to prevent that behaviour or at least being kind to you after the event, not for Shafila. She had two tyrants as parents. So this teacher is deeply concerned and credit to this teacher because she's constantly trying to help Shafila and she contacts social services and they go to the school and visit her. But at this point, Shafila's not got any visible injuries and she starts to downplay the incident. I understand that. I think she was terrified. I think she didn't trust the authorities. She'd spoken to them on many occasions and she'd been let down. That does not impart a lot of hope. And I've worked on another case, that's a murder case, where literally the sister-in-law called the police, told them what was gonna happen if they didn't intervene, and that individual was still taken to Pakistan and murdered. So I understand the reticence to be engaged with authorities at times, and that's not me coming down hard on the police. For the most part, they're bloody amazing, particularly in the UK, and we're very lucky in spite of certain attitudes towards certain individual officers. But it does show why mistrust exists. So she says at this point, no, I don't want any social services involvement, so the file's closed. Again, don't think it should have been closed. I think if a teacher has information and you can show that that teacher is obviously credible, which that teacher was, and the child or young adult or young person is struggling to formulate the fact that they are being abused. It's because they're being abused. The idea that a victim finds it easy to betray their perpetrator is ridiculous. That's why abuse carries on. Because people genuinely feel when they are victims that they have done something wrong, even when they haven't. So often the idea of saying, yes, this person has abused me, please do something about it, is really challenging because you have this incorrect loyalty 
towards them. It's misdirected, misattributed, but it exists. Now, in November 2002, a friend comes across Shafila in the park, and at this point, she's looking really cold and really shaken. And she's been away from college for a week and a half. So this triggers something in the friend. She knows that something's gone wrong. And she's got faded bruises all around her neck. And also she's got scratches to the left side of her neck. And she says to her friend, she's been locked out of the house. She's not allowed in. So we're seeing this escalation. She's been put in these precarious scenarios. You know, so much for these parents being concerned about who she's hanging out with or being concerned about her welfare, but actually more than happy to just have her out on the streets, feeling unwell, after being beaten, not having access to food or money. And yet, this is apparently them trying to prevent shame being brought on them when actually the only shame is being bestowed on the parents because they are shameful. End of 2002, something good happens to her. She feels like it's mushtak bagas and they become an item. That's really important for her. She has hope. She has an opportunity to feel normal, to spend time with somebody that she really likes. And she'd met him when she was with a family in Blackburn. Again, Blackburn is a place where there is a high Muslim population. And she was probably with a boy who reflected lots of her values. And he'd seen her and found her really attractive. And she was really attractive. And he'd slipped her his phone number. And it's at this point that the two had started talking. And she starts pretty immediately telling him how unhappy she is. She says that she's really concerned that she's going to be forced into an arranged marriage and that she was experiencing all this abuse at home. So he is instantly on side. He believes her fully, he sees it. He knows how problematic these situations can be. He also will recognize how difficult it is for a girl in this situation because there is less power for the female. Again, something I fully disagree with, but nonetheless, we see that play out in these circumstances. Again, I'm not suggesting for one minute that all Muslim relationships are like this. They clearly are not. I am saying in these uber traditional ones, they have problems because of the power imbalance. If you are a girl, you are not in the same position of power. And I don't like power imbalances in relationships per se. The conflict in Shafila's family increases after this. So in 2003, we're seeing real problems in the household that are even bigger than what we've seen previously. And Shafila is just absolutely desperate to escape. She knows what's gonna happen to her. She knows what's in store for her. She knows that if she's taken to Pakistan, she's gonna get sorted out. And do you know what that sorting out means? It means she's gonna have her westernized ideas removed from her completely, and there's gonna be an arranged marriage. Her parents have decided that they wanted to marry a cousin. He's in his late 20s, which is a decade older than their daughter. And also he's been brought up in a real country area in Pakistan. He's got no Western values. She's gonna be a prisoner. It's not gonna be a marriage of love. It's gonna be a marriage of convenience and entrapment. They essentially want their daughter to become a devoted wife. And they also make it clear they don't necessarily want her to ever return to the UK. How can you do that? How can you do that to somebody who's unwilling? If you want to do that, knock yourself out, off you go. But it's very hard for a girl brought up in the way that she's been brought up with all of these opportunities around her, with big dreams of being a barrister to be told, no, you're gonna go and live in a country area in Pakistan and you're gonna be a mother and a wife and be devoted and that's it. Get rid of any ideas about your future. You have no choices over it. It's awful. And it's serious that they're thinking of doing this because the parents have accepted a rishta, which is basically a formal offer of marriage, and that's from her cousin. So this is now becoming very real for her. When we look back at Shafila's history, she did run away when she was 11, and it's something that she decides that she's going to do again. And the boy that she's met, Mushtag, he says, I'm going to help you escape. He drives to Warrington early hours one morning in February 2003. He waits in the car while Shafila climbs out of the front room window. She's got a bag of clothes with her and she does this because her dad locks the front door at night and makes sure that she can't get out. So climbing out of the window gives her that opportunity to escape. And she's gone for 12 days. So she really makes a break for it. She spends two nights at her boyfriend's brother's house in Blackburn and then the couple go to a B&B. &B. Now he says that during that whole period of time, they did not have sex, they just kissed. And that shows the innocence of their relationship. 
and the fact that she probably felt some real moral obligation to not have a relationship sexually with a boyfriend. You know, she herself probably wanted to be in a long-term relationship, committed, possibly even married before that she did that. But it shows as well that knowing what her parents are like, the idea of her being with a boy, spending the night even in the same room, albeit fully dressed with a boy, kissing a boy, wow. Let's just think about what she's been through so far, just for talking to boys. And look at the level of violence. She's been starved, she's been beaten, she's been attacked by both parties. She's been threatened with her life and she's been told she's gonna to be forcibly married. So we automatically know that it's not likely that this is gonna end well. Her parents have been constantly trying to contact her during the time that she's been away, but she just doesn't wanna to speak to them and neither would I because you would be terrified of what you're gonna to be told. The family then report her disappearance to the authorities and it's on the 3rd of February, Iftikhar goes to Shafila's school and he actually confronts the teacher that she's confided in. So he is rageful. He is really angry. He feels like this teacher has interfered in an area that she had no right. He's really aggressive during the altercation. He blames her for his daughter running away, not himself of being a violent, abusive, hostile bully. And he even says to this teacher that he's gonna get sacked. Imagine feeling so arrogant and superior that you can take a teacher who has done her job effectively, who has followed child protection protocol, albeit it didn't occur to follow through in the way it should have. And I feel really sorry for that teacher because I imagine that they feel responsible for the fact that things didn't turn out better, even though actually they are not responsible for anything. It is not their fault that the things that happened were not taken seriously enough to stop what plays out occurring. So now she's under threat of being sacked, which again shows the level of bullying this individual is willing to go to. It's during this period of time where he's dealing with school in this way and threatening everyone that Shafila actually approaches a homeless charity. And she says that she's staying with friends, but she's had to remove herself from her family because she's been domestically abused and she's being forced into an arranged marriage. But because she's staying with friends, she doesn't really have a lot of security. And she actually gave a senior homelessness officer a note stating, over the past few years, I've been experiencing domestic violence, which has stopped me going to college on more than one occasion. They've also forced me to quit my job and I had saved 2,000 pounds, which they took out of my bank account. But my fear is that my parents are gonna get me to go to Pakistan and to get me married to someone and leave me there. That must have been horrific. And I wish that there were protective mechanisms put in place at this point. Because we know that honour killings occur. We know that girls in the UK are forced into marriages that they don't want. We even know in the UK that forced female genital mutilation takes place. So we see that these awful activities occur. And it's so important that we do better to prevent it. Because Shafila should never have been in a scenario where she was even walking on the streets by herself knowing that these threats were around and abundant. And the problem is, because she's walking to college, her father has access to know where she will be. So because she's trying to stay in her education and she's walking with her friends to college, he's driving around looking for her, he sees her. She spots her dad's taxi and she is absolutely terrified and she's so scared that the friend said she didn't even run, she just stood frozen to the spot. And her dad just drives over, drags her physically off the street, forces her into the car. She feels crying hysterically. At this point, a friend runs to school, reports the incident to the teachers and the police are called and they spoke to Shafila, but they speak to her when her father is present. Now, how likely when you're under pain of death and threat, are you gonna tell the truth? She felt under duress because her father was there. So she then says, okay, like I have had problems in the past, but you know, they're all sorted and you know, I will go home. And that is often what we see when victims are put in these scenarios. They comply 
they already know they're in serious trouble because the perpetrator has access to them and they feel a level of betrayal because the person is there witness to what they're saying and so they just think it's better for everyone if they just comply and go with the abuser obviously we all know the best way in these situations is just to scream that you're being abused and not comply and make damn sure that you never have to set foot in the house that is so threatening for you ever again. A week after that incident, so February 2003, she's drugged and she's taken to Pakistan. Now it's believed Iftikhar has been prescribed sleeping tablets. They believe that they were crushed up, put in a drink, her mum had given her a drink and Shafila had actually been really happy and positive because it was the first time her mother had been really nice to her. So her mother's changed her attitude, started being a little bit more friendly. Why? Not because she cared, but because she wanted to coerce her into drinking these drugs. So obviously we have now a much more complicit young girl because she's drowsy. She's just going to go along with whatever she needs to do. And she's told at this point, whilst under the influence of drugs, that they're going to a family wedding. And what happens when she arrives? They take the passport off her. So when she arrives in Pakistan, the reality is clear. She's there to meet the cousin that she's supposed to marry. And she doesn't like him. Simple as that. And her mum says, well, you better get used to it because you are staying in Pakistan and you are not returning to the UK. Imagine the psychological distress that she's under. All her worst fears have come true. Every one of those fears that she had, every foreboding belief has come true. And the minute that she realises that this is her immediate future, she self-harms. And she self-harms awfully. She drinks bleach. Imagine the level of pain you're in. Drinking bleach is a suicidal activity. It can kill you and does kill people, but it's also the brutality. Because to be willing to harm yourself so brutally, so painfully in that moment because you're so distressed demonstrates the parallel that you have with what you see as the potential future of your life. It's willing in that moment to remove any shred of hope for your future by drinking bleach than to stay in that situation. How desperate was she? Her parents were really angry as well. They weren't accepting, oh, right, okay, what we need to do is acknowledge that my daughter is really struggling with this and kind of take her out of this situation and work through it. No, they're just angry with her. That suicide attempt caused her horrendous issues. Now, her parents claimed to other people that she didn't do it on purpose. Basically, she drank mouthwash and it was bleach by mistake. They said that she was having some kind of blackout. It's an obvious lie, but they're trying to cultivate this idea that she's not unhappy and it was just an accident. She seriously injured herself in this. She suffered horrific caustic burns and it caused extensive damage to her throat. Now her father, in spite of this, returns to the UK and leaves her in Pakistan. But she hasn't had the right treatment, which means that after a couple of months, she's in such a terrible condition that she's lost loads of weight, she's really unwell, and basically, her cousin doesn't want to marry her anymore. She's no longer wanted as a bride. As far as they're concerned, her actual experience as a human being has deteriorated to such a point that she is damaged goods. So this is going to infuriate her parents even further, isn't it? In May 2003, they bring her back to the UK. As soon as she arrives, her father calls an ambulance because she's desperately unwell and she goes on to receive a prolonged period of hospital treatment. And if she can't, tells the Asian nurse at the hospital that he doesn't want any of the white nurses given any information about his daughter. So he says that no one needs to give any information about his daughter to anyone other than him and his wife. So he literally tries to get the Asian nurse at hospital on side because he will believe mistakenly that this particular individual fully understands the kind of control level that he and his wife are exerting on this poor defenseless girl. And he's trying to coerce this nurse into doing what he wants because he wants to ensure that no one outside the parameters of a family are aware of the horrible abuse that she's experiencing. And her parents spend 
the entire time at her bedside. Now, I've worked with nurses who have seen this play out, particularly with burn victims, where they know that the family is responsible for what's happened to the individual, but the family don't leave the bedside at all. So people can't get an opportunity to infiltrate that situation, find out what's happened and protect the victim. And this is what happens in this case. They just remain there all the time, not for love, but just to make sure that she doesn't talk. And the nurse who was involved in the case said, the way I would describe these parents are just as a loveless couple. They're a loveless parenting couple. They do not have love for their family. When she feels discharged from the hospital, in spite of the fact that she's in this really weakened condition, she continues to fight her father's wishes. She is really struggling at this point to eat and drink. And to put that in context, the reports say that she couldn't even swallow saliva. That's how damaged she was. She lost loads of weight. She dropped to around five stones, so incredibly weak. And she tries to restart her life with respect. She gets a telesales job and she starts at Priestley College in Warrington in September 2003. And she even gets back in touch with her old friends and also tries to rekindle the relationship with her former boyfriend. But her parents, again, are just really unhappy with her. They try to isolate her. The tensions really increase at home and so too does the abuse in spite of the fact that they are dealing with this very underweight, very vulnerable and frail young girl. On the evening of the 11th of September 2003, Shafila's mother picks her up from her part-time job at a call centre. Now they argue on the way home. And the reason that they argue is because Shafila's wearing a t-shirt which included a hooded cardigan and tight fitting trousers. Ask yourself a question, go through that a minute. She was wearing a t-shirt, a hooded cardigan and tight fitting trousers. Literally every part of her body was covered, but it was not enough. Her mother wasn't happy. When she gets home, her parents go around searching her bag and they find money and they start accusing her of hiding that money. Money that she's earned, money that she's entitled to, money that she knows her parents will steal like they stole the £2,000 last time. Money that potentially she's hoping will help her escape. The argument carries on and Shafila at this point is sitting on the couch watching TV and her father starts to reprimand her for her behaviour. It's at this point her mother literally says to him, finish it here. And she hands him a plastic bag. As was usually the case, this means that this whole event was going to end in violence. However, this time it's going to go much, much further. So in a frustrated rage, taking the plastic bag off his wife, she feels his father stuffs it into her mouth, blocks her airways, her already compromised airways from the bleach. He and Fazana then push her onto the settee. They cover her face with their hands and they suffocate her. They kill her in the presence of the other four children, the youngest of which was four. No, they kill her in the presence of the other four children, the youngest of which was seven at the time. They are all witnesses to this brutal murder of their own sibling. Now, the only one I can say didn't think that that action was incorrect was her brother. His distorted views because of his upbringing and values literally made him feel that she deserved it. So he told his parents, look, she deserved what she got. Parents now have a problem. They need to get rid of a body and they take Shafila's corpse and they dump it in undergrowth on the banks of the River Kent in Sedgwick, which is a beautiful area in Cumbria and horrific to imagine that they did that there. And when a work colleague of Iftikhar reflected on a conversation that he'd once had with him, he actually said that he recalled Iftika saying, I know the Lake District inch by inch. I've toured a lot of times over there if you kill a man, nobody can find the body. Bit of a bizarre thing to say to anybody. I mean, I'm all for, I know the Lake District inch by inch. You should definitely go on some of the walking trails and there's some fabulous cafes where you can get a good range of food. Maybe even check out the lakes, which are second to none. Not if you kill somebody. I know exactly where to dump the body. But is he giving him a message there? The planning, the premeditation, the potential that he's thinking about because he has this intention to end the life of his daughter 
and to not be found guilty of that. He also tells the children that they cannot talk about Shafila's disappearance unless they are to verify that as far as they are concerned, she's run away, apparently in the night. And he says, if you don't say that, I'm going to kill you. And they've seen him do that. So they know that this guy is capable. They know that their own father is not just capable of murdering somebody. He's capable of murdering his own child. Can you get any more threatening than that? Because you are willing to show your children that you will protect yourself over everybody else, even if that involves killing them. This would literally become a horrific family secret and this family secret would last for years. So she feels as parents never even report her disappearance to the authorities. Bear in mind the way that they've been in the past when she's gone missing, on the phone all the time, constantly getting in contact with school, looking around the area to try to find her and yet suddenly they're completely silent. However, a teacher at her previous school, Great Sankey High School, overhears her younger siblings talking about her disappearance. So instantly notifies the police. And at this point, a search begins. That search begins on the 18th of September, 2003. By this time, she's been missing a week as well. Cheshire police look everywhere for her. They scour wasteland near her home. There's no sign of her. They also look at CCTV footage and she doesn't appear on it. She just looks like she's vanished into the air. Forensic teams also carry out detailed examination of the family's semi-detached house and the vehicles. And one of the things that strikes them as deeply concerning is that silence. There is radio silence from the family. Usually they'd be on the phone to her all the time. They'd be checking out where she was. They'd be calling around and this hasn't occurred. So they've not tried to contact her by phone since her disappearance. So the suspicions are really raised. They ask her father, you know, why haven't you reported her missing? So he then claims, well, I would have usually, but because she's over 16, I know there's nothing I can do now. I mean, it's clever in one level because arguably he has a point, she's over 16, so essentially she can get away, but it's not consistent. We expect to see consistent behavior. You don't see an overly controlling, overbearing, overarching, dominating force in somebody's life suddenly go, okay, she can go off and live a life that she wants. It doesn't make sense. And not only is he suddenly blasé about his daughter not being in his house and under his roof and control, her dad goes on to say, oh, well, I just think that she's with her boyfriend. Now, at this point, authorities are like, there is no way that this man, who is so compelled to believe that shame on the family is the worst thing in the world and that this girl needs to act in a way according to his rules, he's suddenly going to be okay with her being with a boy outside of wedlock at 16, not a chance. Police also talk about the fact that her father was obstructive, he was unhelpful, and he was more angry at her disappearance rather than concerned. It's not how you'd be if your child had just gone missing into thin air. You're gonna be worried, and you're not gonna obstruct anyone because you're gonna wanna bring them home. And that's a real red flag to the police. Parents at this point say, it's not us anyway. It's you, police. You're the problem because you're racist. So again, they create that very big boundary. People are afraid of being accused of those things. And rightfully so. It's a horrible thing to be accused of. And it also makes you feel like you don't have a level of foundation because you're concerned. Are my actions going to be construed that way? Could it be possible I've got that bias? So they are very good at playing that game. They're also really angry at the media attention because implications are being made in the press that there was a possible honor killing that happened. So they're more concerned that there are these rumors in the press that the family may be responsible for the killing, but they're not actually concerned about their daughter. So they're worried about the reports about them because they're massively egocentric, but they're not concerned about the fact that their daughter is just not around, that she's disappeared. And they even hire a solicitor because they want to get their fake version of events out to the media. Now, because there are a lot of media appeals about her disappearance, a Glasgow pharmacy contact the police. And they believe that they've got CCTV footage of Shafila because obviously they want to help if this child has gone missing and the parents are potentially being suggested that they've been involved. Then we want to help exonerate them if this girl is just alive and well. So they present them with this CCTV footage that they believe is of Shafila and the parents watch it 
and they're like, it's her. It's definitely her, without a doubt. That's our daughter. You see, you were all wrong. We told you that she'd gone missing of her own volition. We have no case to answer. It's definitely her. However, teacher looks at the footage, who knows her well, and says, absolutely, under no circumstances, is that Shafila. And what does that say to you straight away? Straight away, it tells you that Shafila's parents are looking for an alibi. They're looking for a reason why they are not involved. And they're pretending that they recognize their own daughter who they gave birth to and brought up all those years and see more than anybody else. They're saying that they recognize her in CCTV and it's definitely her. And yet a teacher who teaches her is like instantly able to tell it's not. Please obviously highly suspicious at this point and they're right to be because in reality you and I and Shafila's parents know she's already dead. They're also suspicious of her parents for another reason because if somebody has run away they're going to be using their bank accounts but it hasn't been accessed since the disappearance. Something's clearly amiss. And unsurprising, the police at this point feel that they've got grounds to arrest her parents, and they do that in 2003. Now, the charges are ultimately dropped because they haven't got the evidence required to stack a case up with the CPS. And if you think about it, they haven't got a body. They haven't got forensic evidence. They haven't got CCTV showing them involved in the crime. Yes, they have historic abuse claims, but is that enough to suggest that they're actually murderers? There's a big leap, isn't there? So the case is dropped. This is really frustrating for all the authorities involved because it's clear that it fits the profile of somebody who's been murdered in the so-called honour killing after rejecting her Pakistani suitor. That makes quite a linear sense, doesn't it? Parents then say, well, no, that's not true. We got to a point where she was old enough to make her own decision, she ran away and she's got on with her life. It's not a convincing argument, but it's an argument that without a body has to be taken into consideration. Like I said, hasn't been in contact with friends, hasn't been in contact with family, hasn't used any money, hasn't even attended appointments that she was maybe having for treatment because of her throat injury, and seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. But you know, parents are saying, she's just living her best life. Anyway, the police aren't having it. And again, I love the fact that they do this. They install covert listening devices in the family's home and in Iftika's taxi which makes me happy because it means that firstly, they know that whilst they haven't got this family bang to rights yet, there is a strong possibility that it is a waiting game and they're willing to take their time. So whilst Iftika and his wife are going around thinking they've got away with murder, the police are just being patient. I like that. I think there are a lot of criminals out there who think they got away with things, but really it's just tick tock, tick tock until the day where they get their knock on the door and their rights read before spending a long time in prison. Iftika was recorded on that convert surveillance saying that the UK system works on proof. In fact, he's recorded saying, without proof, even if you sister fuckers kill 40 people, until it's found, they can't do anything to you. The arrogance of that man, profound. Also, interesting use of sister fuckers, but that was literally his words. The device also recorded Shafila's parents discussing what would happen if the police found DNA evidence in the car. So, again, instrumentally suggesting that they have been involved, but not specifically stating it. And remember, it's really important to get the specifics in these cases. So they didn't record anything that was sufficiently incriminating enough to actually charge them with murder. But, divine intervention. Divine intervention! I am God, I shall send floods! Very dramatic of me. And following a flood, she feels body, which is decomposed and just skeletal really, finally is discovered by workmen and it's discovered on a riverbank in Cumbria. Remember what he said about Cumbria? Iftikhar, going on about where you'd put a body. So in February 2004, five months after her murder, her body turns up. They do two autopsies on it, but they find it very difficult to establish how she died because she's so decomposed. 
They do note that part of a skull was missing, but because there's not any blood on her clothing, they don't feel that there was any head injury there. So it's probably something that's happened whilst she's been decomposing and whilst the floods occurred. She didn't have any broken bones. She didn't have any other obvious signs of injury. So the pathologist then says, well, looking at this, the likelihood is that she's been killed elsewhere. So she wasn't killed near the riverbank. Probably she was murdered by suffocation or strangulation and she's then been dumped at the location. I mean, think about that. This is their own flesh and blood and they've just dumped her like trash. They managed to identify Shafila through her dental records and clothing. So now they do have a body. They've also found a gold bracelet and a blue topaz ring, which is also identified by her parents as belonging to her. And locals around that area in Cumbria had noticed on that riverbank a really grotesque smell. It smelled of decay, but they'd assumed that it was a dead animal. Also, dog walkers are able to recall that they saw a really scruffy white van around the time of Shafila's disappearance. And it's at this point that police arrest Iftikhar and Fazana, along with five members of the extended family, and they're all arrested on suspicion of murder. But sadly, they're released without charge because at this point, it appears there's insufficient evidence to hold them. And police do try to get quite a lot of information from the local community, and guess what? They just met with a wall of silence, which is disgusting. Absolutely appalling. How dare a community refuse to help bring to justice individuals who have murdered their own flesh and blood? How dare they? I don't care about your religious conviction. I don't care about your rights to practice that religion. I don't care about your culture. None of that matters when somebody's been murdered. There is no just killing. Shame is not a reason to murder. And the idea that a whole community shuts down and is unwilling to bring individuals, willing to carry out such reprehensible crimes is horrifying. And it happens. And it's so wrong. This collusion is very difficult to break down. And also the police report that in cases like this, witness intimidation is very common as well. So we're not just dealing with the collusion of a community, we're dealing with people's fear levels. So these individuals are afraid to speak out because of the retribution that they may receive. The investigation to this death, it cost over two million pounds. It involved thousands of police hours because they were going to bring the killer to justice. It's as simple as that. The police went full throttle on this case. They knew absolutely without a shadow of doubt that Shabila had been murdered. They knew it was a matter of time. In January 2008, there's an inquest in Kendall, Cumbria, and at that point, the coroner records a verdict of unlawful killing. Shafila's parents ugh, are so arrogant, so unbelievably egocentric, that they decide that they want to try to get that decision overturned in favour of an open verdict. They said that the coroner decision was biased. Why? because you know now that it's an unlawful killing leading it to potentially be drawn to your door. But look at the power play. These individuals feel that they are bigger than the law. Coroner who took part in this case concluded Shafila had been subject of a very vile murder. And she actually brought up the fact that she felt that Shafila was torn between her own wish for freedom and a genuine love for her family particularly for her brothers and sisters, because Shafila was a loving, compassionate, kind, considerate, intelligent, lovely girl. Somebody who would have been a great benefit to our society, who could be practicing law as a barrister today. The police, when they searched Shafila's home, they found some of her belongings and part of them involved poems that she'd written. And one of them was entitled, I Feel Trapped. And it described, her really unhappy life with a family that didn't care about her. And she was right. She wasn't cared for. She deserved to be, absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, but she wasn't. Iftika and Fazana literally at this point thought they got away with the daughter's murder because the police couldn't establish any new leads and the case was reported less and less in the media. And we know what happens there. When cases are reported less and less, they go cold. They're not in the minds of people. And that means the likelihood it is that it won't get solved unless some new information occurs. Anyway, like I said, don't worry. 
we always going to get some justice, aren't we? So seven years after Shafila's death, her younger sister, Alicia, had bizarrely arranged for an armed robbery to take place at her parents' home on the 25th of August 2010, while she, her siblings and her mother is at home. A little bit dramatic and extreme. Maybe she wanted some injuries to occur during that robbery. I don't know. Maybe she had some deep resentment for the family, but she organises this bizarre armed robbery in her own home. At this point, three or four masked guys burst into the house. They search for money. They tie her family up. And it goes well, apart from the fact that the armed robbers seem to know her name. So her family are like, a little bit weird. Had an armed robbery. They robbed us, tied us all up. But they kind of called my daughter by her actual name. So the police arrest her. And it's during the pressure of questioning that she says, can I speak to somebody about another matter? And it's here where she tells the police officer and the solicitor how nine years before, when she was a teenager, she'd watched her own sister be murdered by her parents. Instantly, the police are like, oh, you did an armed robbery. It was a bit of a stupid thing. I kind of understand that your family's weird, so you probably had your reasons. Do we want to prosecute you? Or do we want to put you in witness protection and so we can bring your parents to justice? And that's what they do. They're like, you are now in witness protection and you can be our main prosecution witness. Amen to that. She gives evidence about how she feel her had frantically kicked, tried really hard to fight back when her parents were holding her down and suffocating her. She even described the wide-eyed look of shock and horror in Shafila's eyes when she realised that she was being suffocated. She commented on the fact that her sister at this point was tiny and weak, so vastly underweight, that she didn't stand a chance. She even recalled the fact that her sister wet herself when she was dying. Alicia suggested that during that whole attack, she just watched, absolutely frozen to the spot. And that she concentrated mostly on her sister's legs because they were kicking and then suddenly they stopped. She even recalled that it wasn't enough that her legs had just stopped kicking, clearly indicating that she was likely dead. Her parents kept their hands over her face for another 30 seconds just to make sure. And think about that because this shows you and demonstrates that they wanted her dead. This wasn't somebody who wanted somebody unconscious. They kept those hands there, ensuring that she had died. Alicia said at this point that she ran to her bedroom. Later on, she saw her mother in the kitchen and she was sorting out flowery pattern sheets, bin bags and rolls of tape. And she was wrapping Shaft's body up in it. She then saw her father carrying her sister's completely lifeless body at this point wrapped up into his car. So removing now dead victim to take her body elsewhere. It seems that she'd also gone and told her friends about this, but after she told them, she realised that she had to take it back. And she actually retracted that and said that she'd made it up. And she claimed that Shafila had run away. And this was in line with the parents' orders, as we know. Finally, Fazana and Iftika Ahmed are charged with Shafila's murder in September 2011. It's eight years after her death, but they got them. Nazir Avzal was the chief prosecutor for the CPS. Now, he'd already successfully prosecuted Rochdale child sexual exploitation cases, which is great because he knows just how challenging it is when a whole group of people refuse to take responsibility and close shop, so to speak, to bring individuals to justice, but he'd managed to. The Rochdale child sexual exploitation cases are ones I know very, very well. And to bring those individuals to justice was a major coup because it was really hard to do so. So when it goes to court, both Iftika and Fazana had been released on bail. So they're still free because they're not necessarily seen as a risk to many other people, apart from potentially their children. They plead not guilty to Shafila's murder. They say they know nothing about her killing, and the trial takes place at Chester County Court. The presiding judge is Mr Justice Roderick Evans. Now, the prosecution are unsure right until the day that that first day of trial begins whether Alicia would actually testify against her parents. But, thankfully, she did. So brave of her to stand there 
knowing that you're going to essentially betray your family, potentially your community as well. What are the ramifications of that? But she does. Um, but she does. And she's crying when she gives evidence in court. And to be fair, her mother does as well. Her mother cries in the dark. Her father, like a stone. He shows no emotion whatsoever. Now, there is a screen in court which hides her from her parents, which I think is really important because it must be incredibly challenging to literally have to say the things that you need to say to bring justice about, but it's also at a detriment to your parents' lives. She knows what's going to happen to them. But she tells the court that her parents repeatedly attacked and abused Shafila. She also tells the jury in detail how her sister's been murdered and they believe her. It's as simple as that. One of the questions that she's asked by the defense is, okay, why did you keep quiet for so long? And she merely says, I think it wasn't until I went to university, I saw how wrong my family life was. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Because that's all she feeling wanted was to go to university. Only crimes that she ever had. The only crimes that she ever committed would you just want to be free? Also, she feel her sister says that she feels just utter relief at finally being able to tell the truth after so many years it had eaten her up. She also understood how Shafila felt because she had also turned down a potential suitor that her parents had arranged to marry. And if Alicia's version of events isn't enough verbatim, well, they are corroborated in a letter her younger sister, Mevish, gives to a friend in 2008. In the letter, Mevish has confided in her friend, Shahin Munir, about what had happened to Shafila. Mevish, at this point, is terrified after she's written the letter, and then she says to her friend, can I have it back? However, Shahin had made a photocopy of the letter, which I just think is amazing. Yeah, it would have been great if she could have gone to the police earlier, but I imagine that she felt very stuck. But when she saw Alicia showing this courage, telling the truth about what her parents had done, Shahin went and gave that evidence to the prosecution. And she also gave evidence at the trial, which is just so powerful, isn't it? Suddenly, the cards are falling. These foundations that were considered so impossible to break down are falling. I would say as well, though, that Mevish, the person who wrote that letter, supported her parents at the trial. And she said, no, it was all lies. It had been complete fiction. But it was so obvious that Mevish's letter matched Alicia's version of events about Shafila's murder, that instantly it corroborated all of it. Also worth noting that part way through the trial, there was a massively dramatic turn of events. Fazana changed the statement. And at this point, she says, look, it did happen. My daughter was murdered, but it was all my husband's fault. It was he who attacked Shafila on the day that she disappeared. In fact, she claimed that she tried to intervene during the attack, but that she had personally been punched. She also stated that her husband had later told her that Shafila was fine and never to ask about her again if she valued her life and the lives of her children. And at this point in the revelations, both Iftika and Fazana are taken into custody to be questioned. And Iftika says that this is absolutely lies. This didn't happen. I don't know why she's saying these things, but I do still love her. Not sure you understand love. Because, Iftika, I think that love is probably most summed up between parent and child. And you murdered your child. Anyway, there's a three-month trial. It's a big old trial. And the jury deliberate for two hours, which is a really short amount of time. And then they find both parents guilty of Shafila's murder. Thank God. Now, as the verdict is delivered, Fazana's crying, and yet Iftika just remains completely impassive, just like a rock. He doesn't care. As far as people looking at him, he doesn't feel that there is any emotion tied to this experience. He probably just feels that no one has a right to do this to him. Now, the court did accept that there was no pre-existing plan to kill Shafila that night. However, the fact that the mother stated, finish it here, suggests that they previously had discussed how to resolve the problem which Shafila presented. They were really concerned about being shamed in the community and that concern just completely overruled any love that they had for Shafila. The judge stated that the parents' actions had completely blighted the lives of their remaining children. Now, fortunately, unlike Shafila, younger sister Alicia did escape, but come on, she's never going to avoid the legacy of her upbringing. She'll probably remain in witness protection for life. Can you imagine that? Why? Because she's under threat. 
she brought down this matriarch and patriarch. And because of that, her life's at risk. So she probably doesn't have any contact with her community, her friends, her family members at all. Her life is blighted because of her honesty, because of her willingness to bring her sister's killers to justice. Mivish also attempts to escape. She tried to live independently, but she's basically recaptured, brought back home. And in the end, during that period before her parents were put into prison, she became compliant with her parents' wishes. The youngest daughter was only seven when she saw Shafila killed, and who knows what would have lay ahead of her had they not been brought to justice. I imagine it would have played out very similarly to what experiences her sisters had, which was that she would have been forced to marry somebody that she didn't necessarily love and made to live a life that was considered non-Western, albeit in a Western country. The son, Junyad, well, to some degree unsurprisingly, he remained supportive of his parents, even though he knew what happened. As far as he was concerned, they had grounds to murder her. Honour was more important than life. August 2012, the judge imposes a life sentence on Iftikhar and Vazana for Shafila's brutal murder. He had to decide the minimum sentence before being eligible for parole. So because of the circumstances of the murder, he considered their culpability exceptionally. And he looked at the mitigating factors and they were the murder wasn't premeditated and it's fair to say that neither of the defendants had previous convictions. However, several aggravating factors. Firstly, her parents should have been the people that Shafila could look up to for protection, for kindness. Their actions was a fundamental breach of trust. They also acted together as a team to kill her. They killed her in front of their children. She was at the time in a really vulnerable condition because she was still weak from the effects of drinking the bleach. In the year before her death, she'd been subjected to really violent episodes. She was abducted from the street after she escaped and she was forced back to live in her home. She was drugged. She was taken to Pakistan against her will. They tried to force her into an arranged marriage. The killing was motivated by cultural issues. And after killing her, they tried to conceal the body and they lied under oath to the coroner's court. So the judge had a lot of aggravating factors. And when you've got a lot of aggravating factors, you can bet your bottom dollar, the years are gonna increase. So he imposed a minimum term of 25 years for both parents, minus 66 days that they'd already spent in custody. And the judge stated, for me, this is not an honor killing. It's a clear case of murder. There is no honor in killing. When Iftikhar Ahmed and Fazana Ahmed become eligible for parole, they will be around 77 and 74 years of age. So their lives will certainly have been compromised. It's also really important for me to note that it's highly unlikely they worked alone. It's suspected that there were numerous other people who helped them dispose of Shafila's body, and we probably won't ever bring those to justice. But like I said, when people close ranks, it's very hard to find those accessories. After the trial happened, the chief executive of Bradford Council for Mosques encouraged anybody with information to come forward and to assist the police. So the community was told, you need to start talking. It is not acceptable. There is nothing faithful, religious, culturally appropriate about these kind of actions. Now, many people, rightfully so, from the communities that honour killing is associated with have said we need to stop using that term because it suggests that the victims at fault, that they've acted dishonourably in some way. It implies that the killing is somehow justified. Instead, they say cases like this should be referred to as murder, pure and simple murder, because that's what it is. Now, the Forced Marriage Civil Protection Act 2007 now makes it possible to obtain orders in the civil courts to prevent forced marriages. So work has been done. But it's also really important to recognise that cases like this are also jumped on by those with very far right opinions. And that's used as an excuse to spread messages of hate. It's used to promote Islamophobia because it perpetuates this idea that Islam permits such killings and any such viewpoint is entirely misguided. It really is. And it's not a reason to go about believing that the Muslim faith is bad 
as we know, the vast majority of individuals from the Muslim faith are peace-loving, law-abiding individuals. Now, after the Ahmed sentencing, the Muslim Council of Britain stated that they wish to reiterate that honour killings are in no way, shape or form condoned by Islam. On the contrary, Islam categorically denounces vigilantism, rather encouraging mercy, justice and the rule of law. People in Shafila's position, they're often unaware that they're being abused. They've been brought up to think that they are the problem, that they are bringing shame on their family. Speaking out about the family and the way that they're being treated within it is considered disrespectful. And subsequently, issues are often not reported to the authorities. Still, I'm gonna say it. There is an attitude of victim blaming among traditional Pakistani communities, i.e. it was suggested that she feel it brought shame and disrespect to the family and that she deserved what she got. Hence, the wall of silence during that police investigation. Young women who are Asian in Britain self-harm and display suicidal tendencies three to four times higher than the national average. Think about that. They are more likely to wish to harm themselves, even kill themselves, at a rate of three to four times more than their white counterparts. That tells us something about the way that they are living. And like I said, that isn't me trying to be disrespectful to anybody. It's me exploring the statistics and saying, what can we learn from this? We live in the UK. It's the same around the world in Western countries. When there is Western culture, it means that a young person growing up within it can expect a certain amount of choices independently of those around them telling them what to do. And if those choices don't occur, yet they can see a world around them full of possibility with limitless ideas for the rest of their life, then it's going to cause a conflict. We have to do a better job of listening to young people. Even when young people make choices that their parents don't agree with. And as a society that is diverse and beautiful because there are so many different cultures, we also have to learn to help one another understand. Because right now, if we have girls in certain environments harming themselves or wishing to kill themselves at a stupidly higher rate than compared to their counterparts, there is a lesson we need to learn. There is a conversation that we need to have. There is an opportunity for us to grow. And it begins by accepting that it is possible for a culture and a religion and a society to coexist together, to grow together, to evolve together and to find a place of balance so that young women in particular in these situations don't end up like Shafila or don't end up feeling so trapped that they want to harm themselves. It's about moving forward and it's about individuals, and I believe in the individual process, being given their choices. I hope you found that interesting. Obviously, I've tried to give you a deep dive as to why this case went on and also to talk about who Shafila was and to concentrate on why the police investigation didn't bring those individuals to justice straight away. It was a very challenging case to work on. Also, testament to Shafila's sister, albeit a bit weird with the armed robbery, but as far as being brave enough to come forward, that says something powerful about her. I hope wherever she is on witness protection, she's thriving. She's living the life that her sister never got to live. I hope she uses that as a legacy and reason every single day of the week. And I hope that the children that remain I've had a much better life. And I hope that the remaining siblings were able to go on to live a fruitful life, something their sister was sadly denied. Join me again next time for another True Crime with me and McKenny. If you found the case interesting, give me a subscribe, pop me notifications so you never miss me, and also give us a like, write a comment, let me know your thoughts. Obviously, you might have a completely different point of view. You might be from a culture where you completely understand what the parents are saying, or at least have an understanding of it. I'm not saying that you agree with what happened, just that you connect with the realities of how difficult it is when shame is being bestowed on a family according to the people around them. You may feel really angry about this and feel that it's completely inappropriate that any kind of culture believes that this is acceptable. 
Also, to put it in context, let's be honest, white Western life isn't perfect either. So everybody has a problem with their own environment. It's as simple as that. We can always deep dive and pull apart every situation. So I'm not trying to be biased and negative to anybody out there. Whatever your beliefs are, your beliefs are you're entitled to them. But they should never cause another human being harm. I think we can all agree on that. Thanks again for all my Patreon followers. Really appreciate you. I'll be uploading more podcasts there and take care. See you soon.